In Ezekiel chapter 22, God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 22 and verse 30, there the Lord said, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Today, Jesus is looking for men and women that are willing to stand in the gap. To fill the hedgerow, as the original King James would say. What is he talking about? What do we mean? We need people to stand in the gap. That is that we need men and we need women that have prepared themselves. Prepared themselves to handle and to deal with the various questions, problems, and different situations that arise within our lives from time to time, and especially our spiritual lives. Friends, you're well aware that today we are living in a world that has gone mad. The vast majority of individuals today are presenting themselves daily as a slave not to righteousness, but to the prince of darkness. And there are countless ways that this is being done. It is being done through things, for example, like the homosexual agenda, the godless climate agenda that we hear about every day, not to mention the horrific influence of Darwinism around us every day. And we could go on and on. It is past time for individual Christians to stand up, be strong, be courageous. And that can only be accomplished. We can only stand in the gap if we have prepared ourselves and diligently done that. We live in a day when our brotherhood is in serious trouble. Do you realize that at least half of our congregations today do not have elderships? Do not have men that have prepared themselves or had the courage to stand up and to serve? It doesn't happen overnight. It takes preparation. It takes diligence. It takes time. Do you realize what I, what I just stated? Half of the Lord's church today is not even scripturally organized. And in fact, many of that half that are scripturally organized are led by unqualified men. Brethren, we have a serious problem. And that's not just elders. The same can be said for deacons. And that's not to even mention the fact that we do not have enough preachers to even fill our pulpits. Think about it. Our preaching schools have small classes year after year. I remember a few years ago going to Brown Trail when Preston graduated and seeing how small that class was when the fields were so wide under harvest. <coughs> Went to Jared's, saw the same thing. Many of you remember a year ago, uh, a group came here from Brown, all their students came. There were seven. And I believe only two graduated. Think about that. And that's not, that's all, the, you, the same can be said for Southwest or Memphis or BCS or wherever. We've got a real problem. We need to be spreading the gospel. It takes 
preparation to preach the gospel. And it is time for men to begin to prepare. Throughout the brotherhood, congregations struggle to find men and women to teach classes. You know, the fact is, in most places, if you make it known that you're willing to teach a class, you'll get to, and you probably won't get a break for 10 years. The need is so desperate. Brothers, sisters, we are surrounded, even within the church, we are surrounded by biblical illiteracy. Far too many of us today cannot identify a false teaching due to our lack of knowledge and preparation in the scriptures. And that's a dangerous thing. One might say, well, I, I trust the, the preacher and the elder. They'll watch out for me. They'll take care of me. I think we just talked about the fact that half the churches don't even have elders. Many are led by unqualified men. Are you, are you really willing to put your soul in that position if you've not prepared yourself? But I want you to consider how important preparation is. You see, we can't fix these problems without preparation. Let's think of some individuals over the course of time and in regards to preparation. Moses. Did Moses just one day wake up and he's going to lead Israel? Lead them out of Egypt and, and, and lead them for many years? No. Moses spent 40 years in preparation for his day to lead Israel. What about in the days of Joshua? I would think most people would consider the days of Joshua to be Israel's finest hour. Did Joshua one day just wake up and say, well, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to be a great leader for Israel, and we're going to do great. No, because think back. When you read through Gen uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, who was always there at Moses' side preparing himself? Was it not Joshua? You see, he took it seriously. Remember, if we jump forward in time, the forerunner to Jesus, the one who, who cleared the path, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, what? He spent years in preparation for his work in the wilderness. We think of those great men like Peter and Paul and the other, the other apostles. They were great leaders. They were great men. What did they do? Did they one day just wake up and decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do great things for God? No. They walked beside Jesus day after day for three years, learning, preparing. Why should we think we could do less? Not to mention Timothy and Titus, who trained at the feet of Paul, preparing for the day that Paul would leave them and they would be the ones who would be leading God's people. They prepared. In fact, as Josh read a while ago, in Luke 2.52, we read about Jesus growing in stature, stature and wisdom. At the time of that verse, Jesus was 12 years old. He was about his father's business. Remember how he had gotten separated his, from his parents as they had gone to Jerusalem to observe uh, the Passover? And so when they started back, the big caravan they were in back to their home, they thought Jesus was with relatives or friends, and they got out, and they didn't find him. And so they had to journey. Can you imagine the worry they had? the fear of what had become of Jesus. They, got, they traveled back to Jerusalem. They got back to Jerusalem and it says they spent three days looking for him. 
Jesse, how would you feel by the third day you're looking for joy and you hadn't found her? Panic. Anxiety. But they finally found him after three days. <laughs> they found him in the first place. They should have went and looked, really, wasn't it? For he was in the temple. And what was he doing? Remember, he was in there asking questions and, and learning from the teachers. He was 12 years old. He wasn't out kicking cans with other kids. His ministry didn't begin until he was about 30 years old. What was Jesus doing all, during those years? He was preparing. He was preparing to do the will that his father had sent him to do. Even Jesus prepared himself. Can we do less? Go with me back to the book of Ezra. <clears throat> in the book of Ezra in chapter 10, I mean, excuse me, chapter 7 and verse 10, we find Israel at a time when, when they had been neglectful of God. They had not retained God in their knowledge. It had gotten so bad that they had even forgotten the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the things that they were supposed to do annually for many, many years. And they discovered it. And Ezra, Ezra made a great decision at an early point in his life concerning God, concerning what he was going to do about God. And in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, notice what it says. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinance is in Israel. Probably one of the greatest three-part sermons you could ever find right there in that verse. You see what Ezra set out to do? He set out to learn it, to live it, and to teach it. Should we do less? Great damage is being done today in the church from the lack of preparation. Are you ready to do something about it? Preparation. It's serious business. Let's consider a second thing because it goes hand in hand with preparation and that's knowledge. What about the necessity of knowledge? The dearth of knowledge within the church today is causing great destructions. You don't have to go, you don't have to go very far in any direction to find congregation after congregation being destroyed by the dearth of knowledge. But that's nothing new. And we shouldn't be surprised about it. It's an old problem. It goes back even to the ancient days. Notice the prophet Hosea in chapter 4 and verse 6. Look what God said. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Now we use this verse quite often, the first part, when we want to talk about lack of knowledge, and I know you're familiar with it. But I want you to notice the latter part of the verse. Here's the effect. You see, when man leaves God, God eventually, he's very long-suffering and patient, much more than we are, but God eventually will leave you to your own desires. He will reject you. But when we do that, look, and when Israel did that, look at that last part. Look at the consequence. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I 
also will forget your children. You see, lack of knowledge in adults today just as well as then, when we don't share it and pass it on to our children, make no mistake, God will forget you and he will forget your children. Do you want that for your children? None of us do. Think about what examples of how lack of knowledge is destroying lives today. One of the greatest problems we face today in our society is the growing issue of homosexuality. The growing acceptance of it by even our brethren. One of the reasons for this problem is the lack of knowledge. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. And beginning in verse 20. A little lengthy reading here, but I think worth our, worth our consideration. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, the world around us screams to us that there is a God. 21, but look at man. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. What are you see? You're seeing Hosea 4.6 coming to fruition. Verse 25, and look what it leads to who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women burned in their, excuse me, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now notice verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Why did they get to that point? For they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Brethren, the church is failing to retain enough knowledge. And when we do that, make no mistake, it leads to sin false doctrines, and all of the like. But we know the answer. The answer is knowledge and then the application of that knowledge when it is obtained. Consider, consider what the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. You see... This is where so many of us find ourselves. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk 
and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Have you moved to meat or are you still on milk? Think about it. When you encounter someone that asks you a biblical or a spiritual question, are you able to give answer? Or do you at least know where to find the answer? Are you truly prepared to give an answer? Recall what Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready to give answer? Are you ready to defend, to explain your hope that is in you? Do you have the knowledge to earnestly contend for the faith that Jude speaks of in verse 3? Remember that? There, Jude said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Think about it. If John chapter 17 and verse 17 is true, why then do so many of us live functionally, biblically illiterate? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. If God's word is truth, why in the world would I live biblically illiterate? Brethren, we can all see the need to prepare ourselves we can all see the need to increase our knowledge, whether, whether you are an elder, a deacon, a preacher, a teacher, a member in the pew, whether you're a new convert or you've been in the church 70 years, whether you're young or old, whether you're male or female, I think we can see the need. And when we arm ourselves with preparation and knowledge, we are ready to evangelize. One more time, I want us to go back to Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. We think back to that. Israel had forgotten the law. And Ezra, he set out to teach it. But notice, it was only he only set out to teach it after the preparation of learning it himself and then applying it, the living it, to his own life and then to teach others. To learn it daily, to live it daily, to teach others as a daily part of life. Do you recall in, in the Great Commission what Jesus would tell us about reaching others? Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, among those latter instructions to Timothy, Remember, Timothy had learned much by this time, and he said, And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able 
to teach others. This is absolutely necessary if we're going to be evangelistic. We need to seek to fulfill the commands of our Lord Jesus. Let's think about those. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, and, and Jim mentioned that in his prayer this morning, the need. He said, go therefore. It still applies to us. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we don't always continue on past there. Sometimes we stop. But then he said, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. When a man or a woman enters the watery grave of baptism and comes out, it's just getting started. They're a babe. They're on milk. We must teach them. We must teach them so they grow to meat. Teach them so they grow to meat, and then what? Begin to be fruit bearers. Begin to teach others. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And we don't have to be scared to teach him. We don't have to be afraid because he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Mark's account of those same events, in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. We not only need to be able to teach the gospel, but we must spread it, not just be able to do it. This morning, church, how serious are you in regard to preparation? Church, how serious are you this morning in regards to to knowledge and church how serious are you this morning in regards to evangelism there is no better time to start than right now if you're not ready if you're here this morning maybe you've never even taken that first step to become a child of God calling on the name of the Lord, having your sins washed away in baptism, to rise and walk in newness of life, to begin that journey. Maybe you're here today, and yes, you're a child of God, but you've been lax about your preparation. Maybe you've been lax about your knowledge. Uh, maybe you've been just lax about reaching others. No better time to fix it than now. He stands ready to forgive you. Your brethren are ready to forgive you and encourage you and exhort you to move forward and to grow and to move on to the meat of God's Word. Maybe you just wandered off totally and it's time to come home. Maybe you're trying, but it's hard. This Christian walk, it's, it's, it's not a bed of roses. It's not easy. But you can do it. And you just need the prayers of your brethren for strength and encouragement. The prayers of the righteous avail much. They make a difference. Whatever your need is this morning, let it be known. Take care of it today so you don't have to walk around with the weight of it any longer. Whatever we can do for you, let your need be known as we stand together and sing.